What's going on, people? Mike Z-Town here with another episode of Backpack Classics, where I talk about underground hip-hop classic albums that wouldn't normally get touched by dead-in hip-hop. And, um, yeah, we're talking about Cage today, y'all. Um, but if you're wondering how these albums get chosen, it's on my Patreon, where you can become a patron for as little as a dollar a month. You get to vote on albums, add albums to polls, all that type of shit. Um, Patreon members, I know I owe you some shit but I still love you, it's coming. Um, but yeah, I threw up a poll for <clears throat> Cage's Movie for the Blind versus Cage's Hell's Winter, Movies for the Blind won. So I'm cool with that, man. I'd have been cool with either one of those options. But um, yeah, Cage, iconic underground rapper, Def Jux, Eastern Conference, Weathermen. Yeah, man, I, I still remember when I first discovered Cage. It was probably around like, Probably around like 2000, I'd say. Um, I had just heard the Just Don't Give a Fuck single, so I was really into Eminem <laughs> at the time. Um, I'd also heard the raucous shit that he'd done and thought he was super dope. And when the Slim Shady LP dropped, um, I was super into it, man. And uh, if you all remember, there's a skit on there where uh, Ken Kniff is calling M, and M says, who is this, Cage? But I didn't think twice about it until my roommate at the time told me about who Cage was. Same roommate that introduced me to Company Flow. But um, yeah, the interesting thing is I don't even think he knew that there was a connection between Cage and LP. But yeah, so I was like, so M and this guy Cage have a beef. That's interesting. Um, I won't get into all that. You can go Google that. But anyway, fast forward to 2002. I was at a local record store and I found a copy of Movies for the Blind. And uh, I didn't even notice that it was Cage. I was actually attracted to the cover art, which was a reference to the They Live movie poster. So it was an immediate like, oh, this is, this is cool. Um, but yeah, the dope thing is, I was in the record store to pick up LP's Fantastic Damage, and I got this at the same time. And when I got home and realized that Cage was on LP's album, and then L actually produced a song on Cage's record, I was like, what the fuck's going on here? I didn't learn about the whole Weatherman stuff until later. But yeah, when I sat down with Movies for the Blind, I was totally into it right off the first track, man. It starts with Morning Drips, which has this almost playful beat where he's just talking about waking up in the morning and immediately smoking PCP. And even though I was very straight edge at the time, um, hearing this kind of thing did intrigue me, you know? And I loved how the intro ends with him saying, for these are the hateful and shermed out adventures of a child that dared to defy a conformist lifestyle. He's basically outlining what you're about to hear on this record, you know? The whole thing is like a drugged out psycho fantasy. Then it goes into Escape to 88, which kicks off with a beat from Mighty Mai, which has a bunch of nice scratching at the beginning. And uh, one of the scratches is a vocal sample of M asking, who is this, Cage? And I was like, oh shit, this is wild. And I love the way Cage was rapping, like his flow was really nice. And I love the way his bars were filled with multiple rhymes and internal rhymes. Like he was really a complex rapper. And I've always found this line interesting. Too bad no planes flew into MTV. I'll never get a platinum plaque for MP3s. The MTV line has a double meaning, I feel like, you know, because this was during the time where underground rap and mainstream rap were totally at odds with one another. Uh, back then, it was almost like you had to pick a side. I've talked about this before. So someone like Cage wishing planes would hit MTV made sense. But also in 2000, Eminem had a day where he took over MTV and it was called MTV, E-M-T-V. So it would make sense that Cage is talking about flying a plane into the building on that particular day as well, since M was there. The next song, Down the Left Hand Path, is an interesting one. The beat sounds similar to one of the more playful beats that Dre gave M to rhyme over on the Slim Shady LP. Um, I'm not sure if that was intentional, but it was noticeable. But again, Cage's rhyme schemes here are crazy, and I always like this line. Light up a J, cast silence over bobbing heads, stuck underground, shit, I might as well rob the dead. Lighten up a J means weed, of course, but listen to the rest of the line, right? J and silent Bob, cast silence over bobbing heads. Uh, I, I don't even care for those J and silent Bob movies, but that line is super dope to me. And the whole being so stuck in underground hip hop, you might as well start pulling jack moves on dead people. Like, <laughs> that shit is good. It could also mean grave robbing, but who knows? Um, I also like this line. Bloody ear canal, hold it down with the towel, because by the time the verse hatch, your stomach's hanging out. 
I thought this was a cool reference that I believe is about aliens, which is one of my favorite movies, uh, hatching in the stomach and bursting it open. I could be wrong about that one, I don't know. But um, anyways, already being a fan of Clockwork Orange, I also really loved this line. Whether a Clockwork Orange or a Murderous Night, a book on what my pops did to Tony Burgess's wife. Tony Burgess was uh, the author of Clockwork Orange. Cage even called himself Alex the Worm King for a while, which is another reference to the book. Too Much is definitely a maniac moment from an extremely high person, as it starts off with him talking about leaving a hospital with his aborted son's fetus, um, and then riding through town causing all kinds of random mayhem, throwing molotovs, getting wasted on wormwood, shooting at celebrities. And again, the rhyme schemes here are insane. Um, in Stony Lodge is another interesting track here. It's it's another kind of playful beat produced by the legendary Jay Zone. And Cage is talking about his time spent at Stony Lodge, which is a psychiatric facility in New York. And the shit Cage is talking about here is just wild. You know, being incorrectly medicated, feeling zombified and suicidal. Now you cry and pet while I'm waiting for the drugs to kick in like a dying vet. Such a great bar that really outlines uh, Cage's frame of mind at the time. Songs like the soundtrack really nailed down the idea that a lot of people had that Cage and M were cut from the same cloth because the rhyme schemes here, again, are crazy, but that's just one thing. I, I feel like the numerous random ways that Cage describes killing his stepfather definitely feels like the style that M was running with at the time. Um, and the way it rolls directly into Among the Sleep was always impressive to me. You know, it, it really feels like one song. Um, the way the Mighty My beat transitions right into the RJD2 beat is just so dope. And Cage's rhymes here are super dope, man. Describing these multiple vivid dreams he's having of different types of death. And everyone who's a Cage fan knows the song Agent Orange. You know, that super ill necro beat that samples the music from Clockwork Orange beautifully. Uh, it's easily one of the, the hardest beats to come out of the underground, hands down. And this was an absolute classic back then. You know, the way it opens up was pretty much burned into a lot of people's brains. I'm against the machine-like rage. Bees say I hate you, Cage. After circle jerks, I wash my hands off and do dirt. Sick with a smirk, plus happy disturbed. Any Cage fan knows the next line, but I'm not finna put it in this video. I already feel like YouTube is gonna suppress the shit out of this um, due to the language, but yeah. Agent Orange was the song that really got his name out there. But, uh, but Suicidal Failure may be my favorite song on here. It's got a great beat and it's some of Cage's wildest lyrics. You know, like the title suggests, it's basically talking about Cage attempting to commit suicide in a bunch of random ways, but not being successful at any. And it's it's really dope. Cut my wrist and walk past some crips bleeding red in hopes that I get shot in the fucking head. Hilarious, hilarious. But uh, the hook is so good. I'm a suicidal failure, look my life's a failure, I can't make it in rap, even my birth's an error. Do what I can to catch a quick death, but I'm meant to be here and that's the fucking hell I live with. Unlike Tower 1, I didn't know until way later that this song had a few lines tossed at R.A. the Rugged Man's direction. Uh, I knew it sounded like he was saying Hey R.A. at the beginning of the song, but I thought that was more of a shout out, because I knew that they had done the video for bottom feeders um, with Smut Peddlers, Smut Peddlers being Cage and the High and Mighty, so I thought they were cool, but um, I guess not. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, it makes this next line hit a little bit different. You wanna shoot a video, bring a pistol to Blockbuster. Wanna step to Weathermen, cause you're all cocksuckers. Uh, I'm assuming that beef was ended at some point, but um, at any rate, this is still one of my favorite songs on this album. Um, it also had a D12 shot, in it, but I can't quote that one at all due to the language. Um, but yeah, the features here are great as well. It has copyright who says, uh, Dr. Strange will sop your range with a stinking bucket of piss and cock block your brain if you think you're fucking with this. And the way Mr. Eon ends his verse with, y'all couldn't see my ass if I was in hospital gowns. I love it. Holding the Jar features some vintage LP production and I love how Cage wrote this beat. And uh, the final track, Pussy Money and War, has one of my favorite beats on the whole album, produced by Mighty Mai. Um, it's got this nice, almost playful bounce that goes really well with Cage's off-the-wall lyricism and subject matter. 
Don't have your moms being like, that's my boy, then go sign the papers to have your corpse destroyed. I mean, the line is dope, man. Everyone knows, you know, moms say that's my boy when they do something good, but they can also say the same thing if they're about to have their son's body either embalmed or cremated. Either way, it's a dope line. But yeah, I've always felt like this was an undisputed underground classic. Cage has been on a couple albums before this. He dropped a mixtape with some dope tracks, so he definitely made a name for himself as being this kind of crazy MC around New York. Uh, both crazy as in wild lyricism as well as crazy antics but this album really in my opinion at least solidified his skill level like people really saw that this dude had crazy skills on the mic as well as an impeccable ear for beats and he had charisma on the mic like few others had at the time you know the crazy shock lines didn't come off like pretend or some corny dude doing the shit for attention it really felt like this was going through cage's mind at the time you know um i remember sitting down with ryan from man bites dog records and him putting me on to even more references from the album that i didn't catch and my mind being blown um, I, I just wish I remembered them now. I should have wrote this shit down. Um, but yeah, I remember one of them was, if you read the song titles as in like every other song, they give the listener another just weird message. Hold on, I'll do it real quick. Let me just show this. This is like, you know, original press, still sealed, you know, cause I'm, I'm that cool, no big deal. Morning drips down the left-hand path too much probably causes paranoia among the sleep, a suicidal failure unlike Tower 1, a crowd killer holding a jar 2. I don't know. Um, then you have Escape to 88, Teenage Death in Stony Lodge, the soundtrack Agent Orange, CK1, under Satan's authority, the right out, Pussy, Money, and War. I don't know. I don't know. I'm still confused, but, you know, if one of you guys get it and can explain that that'd be cool um yeah i don't know doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me i can see how there's definitely a message there i just don't know exactly what it is but either way that's fucking cool but yeah that's it um this is an incredible album in my opinion i listen to it regularly um i may still do hell's winter at some point because i have a lot to say about that album as well but if you're a fan of this album drop some comments down there in the comment section and let me know what you think of it um, and if there's some other Backpack Classic albums that you want me to talk about, drop them down there. I'll throw them on a poll, and I'll put it on Patreon, and we can see what happens from there. But I'm definitely trying to get back into doing this shit more often. So, um, cross your fingers for me, you know what I'm saying? But, um, hopefully y'all are well. And, um, yeah, as usual, thank you for loving, thank you for loving, thank you for being you, and I'll see you guys next time. Alright? Peace out. Bye.